Welcome to Easy Alim Learning Simplified. My name is Ruth and today we are going to be discussing the topic mole and we're going to be looking at ionic reactions. So in the previous lesson we were able to look at stoichiometry and we were able also to look at uh, dilution of solutions. So for this reaction we're going to see some of the ionic reactions. Being taught to write an ionic equation is very common in a chemical reaction. So we are going to see what are some of the reactions in which you are required to write ionic equations. So first of all, an ionic equation is a chemical statement showing the movement of ions. That is the cations and anions from reactants to products. So you notice when you're writing an ionic equation, you'll be focusing on, on mostly the ions. So when you look at an anionic compound, it's made up of cations and anions. So we are going to break down these cations and anions separately, and then we are going to see how they react in that equation. Solids, gases, and liquids do not ionize. So every time we have solids and gases and liquids in an equation, they're not going to break down into ions. Only ionic compound. So we are only going to ionize only ionic compounds and the ones that are in aqueous solution or in molten state. The ones that are in solid state do not ionize because the ions are in a fixed position. So those are what we are going to look at. So solids, gases, and liquids do not ionize. So an ionic equation is usually derived from a stoichiometric equation by using the following guidelines. So remember in our previous lesson, we talked about stoichiometry and we talked about how we use stoichiometry to get the masses of reactants and products. So sto stoichiometric equation is one that is balanced with corrected symbols. So we are going to derive ionic equations from those stoichiometric equations. So these are the way we write ionic equation. First of all, we need to have a balanced stoichiometric equation and we have it needs to have the correct state symbols, both for the reactants and the products. You see the importance of having correct state symbols will enable us to know if those uh, substances will ionize or not. We have said the solids, liquids, and gases do not ionize, so it is important to indicate the kind of state symbol that we have in both reactants and products. And then after that, you are going to split the cations and anions. Remember, we have it's an ionic compound which is in aqueous or molten state, so the ions are mobile. So we are going to split them into cations and anions, and then uh for example, for the ones that are in aqueous state, and then we are going to cancel any cation and anion that appears in both sides of the product and reactor side. Basically, we are saying the ones that have equal uh, states in both sides, which are in aqueous state, we are going to cancel them out. And finally, we are going to derive the equation, and that equation is what we call the ionic equation. So let's do a few examples so that you can see what we mean. So first of all, ionic equations can be formed in the preparation of insoluble salts, as we said in form two. So all insoluble salts are prepared by reacting two soluble salts. And when you mix two soluble salts, you're going to form one soluble and one insoluble salt. And the insoluble salt is going to be a precipitate, can come in different colors. The most common color is a white precipitate that is separated by filtration. So an example of a reaction is when silver nitrate solution is added to sodium chloride solution. So there is an interaction that occurs on the ions and sodium nitrate is formed uh, and a white precipitate of silver chloride is formed. So if you were to write the ionic equation for this equation, the first thing we said we have to write a complete equation that is balanced with correct state symbols. So we will start with silver nitrate. Uh, reacts with sodium chloride to form silver nitrate, silver chloride. Remember, we said this is the white precipitate, so it's in solid color plus sodium nitrate. If you look at this equation, you notice that it is balanced. You can go step by step and confirm that. So the moment we write an equation and it's balanced, the next step is to separate the cations and anions for the aqueous solutions or molten. In this case, you can see we have some aqueous solutions in our equation and solid. So we are going to separate silver. Silver uh, is positive, aqueous, plus nitrate ion, which is also minus, plus sodium ion, 
plus chloride ion to form silver chloride. Remember, we do not, we cannot separate the solids like we said in the previous uh, statement. Then we separate the sodium nitrate and the nitrate ions. So the next step is to cancel out the ions that are occurring in both sides uh, in aqueous state. So if you look at silver in the reactant is in aqueous state, in the product is a solid state, so it's not similar, so we do not cancel that. Uh, nitrate ions are aqueous in nature in the reactant, and they are still aqueous in nature in the product. So we can cancel that out because they are similar in both sides. And then sodium ions are in aqueous state in the reactant, and they are also in aqueous state in the reactant. So we cancel that out. The chloride ions are in aqueous state, but in the products they are in solid state. So we do not cancel that. So the remaining ions, so we put the remaining ions together, plus the chloride ion to form silver, silver chloride. So this is the ionic equation that is formed from the reaction between silver nitrate and sodium chloride. So that's how we form the ionic equation. Let's look at another example. So when barium nitrate solution is added to copper 2 sulfate solution, copper nitrate solution is formed and a white precipitate of barium sulfate is formed. So the first step is to write the equation. So we have barium nitrate. Barium has a valency of 2 which reacts with copper 2 sulfate and there is an interchange of the anions so we form barium sulfate which is solid in state the white precipitate plus copper nitrate remember copper has a valency of 2 aqueous so the next step is to balance so you notice our bariums are okay our nitrates are also okay Copper is uh, okay and sulfate is okay. So you notice our equation is already balanced. So the next thing is to break down the ionic compounds that are in aqueous state into ions. So barium, barium nitrate will be barium ions with a 2 plus, plus two nitrate ions. You can see there's a two outside the bracket. Plus copper ions plus sulfate ions to form barium sulfate, which is solid state, so we do not uh, dissociate it into ions because it's in solid state, but you can dis dissociate the copper nitrate or you can break it into cations and ions. So we have the copper ions and then we have two nitrate ions, as you can see from the bracket. So you notice the charges will always balance out. You see barium has a 2 plus with a nitrate which has a negative, but two of them will have 2 minus. So 2 plus and 2 minus balances out. So you notice in case you do any mistake, you can check if the charges are balancing out. That way you know if you have done any mistake. So the next step is to cancel out the, the charges that are in the same state uh, in the both reactants and product. So barium in the reactants is aqueous. In the product, it's solid, so we do not cancel that. Nitrate is aqueous in the reactant and aqueous in the solid, so we cancel that out. And then copper ions are aqueous in the reactant and they're also aqueous in the product, so we cancel that. Sulfate ions are aqueous but solid state in the product, so we do not cancel that out. So we put down what we are remaining with, barium ions plus sulfate ions to form barium sulfate. So this is the ionic equation. Finally, a one more question in regards to preparation of insoluble salt. So a yellow precipitate of potassium iodide is formed from the reaction of lead 2 nitrate and potassium iodide. So we are reacting lead nitrate. So this is how we write lead nitrate. Remember it's lead 2 nitrate. So valency for lead is 2 which reacts with potassium iodide to form, there is an interchange of ions to form lead iodide, which is solid instead, plus potassium nitrate, which is aqueous instead.
So the next step is to balance out. You can see we have two nitrate ions in the reactants and only one. So we put a two in front of potassium nitrate. And then you also notice that now that we have put a two in front of potassium, we have to put a two in front of this other potassium to balance out. So also this causes our iodide ions to be balanced, as you can see, because they were two in the product. So this balances the equation. So the next step is to break down the ionic compounds into their ions. So lead ions, which is a 2 plus aqueous, plus two nitrate ions, as you can see from the bracket, there are two of them, plus two potassium ions, as you can see from the coefficient, plus two iodide ions. Remember these two, the coefficient in front covers for all the atoms in the compound. And then to form lead iodide, lead iodide is solid state, so we do not break it, it into ions. And then we have two potassium ions and two nitrate ions from potassium nitrate. So the next step is to cancel out the ions that are similar both sides. So lead ions are aqueous in the reactant and solid state in the product, so we do not cancel that. Nitrates are in aqueous state in the reactant and aqueous state in the product, so we cancel them out. Potassium are in aqueous state in the reactant and aqueous state in the product, so we cancel it out. Iodide ions are aqueous state in the reactant but solid state in the product, so we do not cancel them out. So we end up finally having lead two ions plus two iodide ions to form lead iodide, which is in solid state. So this is our ionic equation. So ionic equation also can be derived from a neutralization reaction. A neutralization reaction is a reaction where acids react with bases to form salt and water. So you basically form a neutral solution. So when you look at the reactions of alkalis with acids, you can be able to derive an ionic equation from these reactions. For example, the reaction of nitric acid with potassium hydroxide. So when you look at this uh, reaction, potassium hydroxide is aqueous state, reacts with nit nitric acid, which also is in aqueous state to form potassium nitrate, which is in aqueous state plus water, which is in liquid state. Second step is to balance the equation. We have one potassium both sides. We have four oxygens both sides. And we have two hydrogens both sides. So it is balanced. The next step is to break these uh, solutions into ions. So we have potassium ion in the potassium hydroxide plus hydroxide ion. Remember, this is a radical plus hydrogen ions in the acid and nitrate ions to form potassium nitrate, which you can break into potassium ions plus nitrate ions. And remember for the liquids, we cannot separate them into, into ions. So potassium ions in the reactants are aqueous and also in the product, so we cancel it out. The hydroxide ions are aqueous in the reactant, but they form water, which is liquid, so we can't cancel it out. Hydrogen as well is aqueous, which forms also water, so we can't cancel that out. But the nitrate is aqueous in the reactant and aqueous in the product, so we cancel that out. So we are left with hydroxide ions plus hydrogen ions, which forms water. So this is the neutralization reaction, and this is the ionic equation. So we will do one more reaction or neutralization reaction. So the reaction of hydrochloric acid with zinc hydroxide. So we write zinc hydroxide, it's written like that, reacts with hydrochloric acid, which is aqueous in state, to form zinc chloride, which is aqueous in state. Remember, there's a two here, plus water which is liquid instead. So the next step is to balance. We have one zinc both sides. We have two oxygens. We have one oxygen this side. 
we have two hydrogens plus one, three, and two this side. So we need to balance. We can put a two here to form two hydrogens and two chlorines, and we put a two here so that the hydrogens as well can be balanced. So that balances the equation. So the next step is to break the ions, the compounds into ions. So we have zinc ions in aqueous state plus two hydroxide ions, aqueous state plus two hydrogen ions in aqueous state plus two chloride ions, aqueous state, which forms zinc chloride, which is zinc ions in aqueous state plus two chloride ions aqueous state but remember for the water we do not dissociate it into ions so the zinc ions are aqueous both sides so we cancel that out and then the hydroxide ions are the ones that are forming water so we can't cancel that out the hydrogen ions also are combining with the hydroxide ions to form water so we can't cancel that out but the chloride ions are in aqueous state in both sides so we end up with two hydroxide ions plus two hydrogen ions to form two molecules of water. So that forms our ionic equation. So let's do one more one question now in regards to ionic equations, but related to calculations. So calculate the volume. So we are looking for the volume. So we put that down of one molar. So we have molarity of sulfuric acid which is one molar that is required to neutralize. So we, we are neutralizing sodium hydroxide, which we have the volume as 25 centimeters cubed, and we have molarity, one molar. So we are going to look for the volume of sulfuric acid. So for us to get the volume, remember when we are looking at molarity, we shall let's say it's moles. Uh, of a volume na liter so we are we have molarity of sulfuric acid we don't we have to look for the moles so that we can be able to get the volume so how do we get moles you get moles from the reaction of sulfuric acid with sodium hydroxide so we have to write that equation so sodium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid will form sodium sulfate plus water. So if we balance this equation, we will put a two in front of sodium. So, and then we also put a two in front of water. So we have four atoms of hydrogen this side and also this side, two, six oxygens and also this side. So the more ratio is going to be two is to one. So we need the ratio of sodium hydroxide to sulfuric acid. So the next thing we use the information that we have on sodium hydroxide to get the moles of the acid as we did in stoichiometry. So let's calculate the moles of sodium hydroxide in the 25 centimeters cubed. So one molar means it's one mole is in a thousand centimeters cubed. So what about in the 25 centimeters cubed? So it is 1 times 25 divided by 1000, which gives us 0 0.25, 0 0.025 moles of sodium hydroxide. So using the more ratio, which is 2 is to 1. So this is 0 0.025 so it means for the moles for sulfuric acid is going to be 0 0.025 divided by 2 which gives us 0 0.10125 moles now we have the moles of sulfuric acid we go to the formula we said we need moles to be able to calculate um, the volume so this 0, 0.0 from the molarity, we know it's one mole of sulfuric acid. So it tells you there is one mole of sulfuric acid in a thousand cent centimeters cubed. What about 0 0.0125 moles will have how much volume? Or you can go ahead and use the formula, you will still get the same answer.
So it is 0 0.0125 times 1000 over 1, which gives us 12.5 centimeters cubed. So in this question, we have applied a lot of things. First of all, we have applied uh, concentration. We have applied stoichiometry, where I write a balanced equation, use the mole ratios to get the moles of the unknown. And then now we are able to get our final calculation. Remember, we have used the first principle method in this calculation, but you can go ahead and use the uh, formula. I've written the formula layer molarity is equal to moles over volume, and you'll be able to get the same answer at the end of the day. You can try it out and compare the answer that we've gotten from this calculation and see if you get the same. So this concludes what we are discussing today. So in the next session, we are going to start on titration. So see you in the next lesson.